Welcome again, everyone. My name is Joey Lovestrand. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in linguistics at SOAS, University of London. And I'm here just to host and get and launch this uh, linguistics uh, seminar on behalf of the Department of Linguistics. Uh, today's MC is actually a guest who we've had here before, Gerald Roche. Gerald is an anthropologist who's interested in languages, especially the intersection of languages with areas such as justice and rights. Uh, he is one of the contributors to a recently published Handbook of Linguistic Human Rights, along with other members of today's panels, a uh, publication that we'll be hearing about a bit today. Uh, he's also a senior research fellow at La Trobe University in Australia, and he is co-chair of the Global Coalition of Language Rights, which uh, just two days ago was uh, promoting and celebrating Global Language Advocacy day and so here just two days after that day we're here to have a discussion uh with uh linguists from around the world about the topic of language rights saves lives so gerald thank you for joining us thanks to all of you on the panel for joining us and helping us put this together and we're really looking forward to this discussion thanks very much joey um so i'll just start off by acknowledging that i'm speaking to you tonight from the which tonight in Australia I'm speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in what's known as uh, Melbourne today and since we're here to talk about language and rights and justice I'll also mention that um, there's an ongoing struggle for language here the Woiwurrung language and the Bunurrung languages are the two indigenous languages um, of this area and both of these languages the speakers are engaged for struggles to reclaim and revitalize those languages so um, i'll introduce a little bit about the event that we're going to have tonight but first um joey's already introduced me i'm gerald roach uh, i will turn the microphone over to our participants so they can each introduce themselves in whatever way they feel comfortable and we can perhaps start with uh, Shivani you can introduce yourself please and then pass on to the next participant and end up back at me okay uh, <clears throat> hello everyone I'm Shivani uh, I'm an academic based in India uh, I largely work uh, on issues of exclusion and marginalization in education uh, which also then brings me to question of language caste gender and others uh, and really looking forward to this interaction and hearing other participants on your questions. So thank you. Thank you, Shivani. Um, perhaps next we can hear from uh, Ahmed. Yeah, I'm Ahmed Kabil. I teach at the at Al Ahawai University in Ifran in Morocco, and my research interests are in um, language power, um, colonialism, critical theory, um, and, 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 and social justice. Um, and I pass it on to, and I'm very delighted to be here today. So I pass it on to uh, Tova and, and Robert. First. Okay, I'm Tova Skutnabkangas from Finland, and uh, Robert and I live in Sweden after uh, 30 years in Denmark on a farm. And I am interested in linguistic human rights, which I started talking about some 60 years ago when I didn't know that uh, that kind of, uh, of an object existed. I'm a bilingual from birth and have learned a few languages after that. And I'm very sad that I have to use this imperialist language with you. <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm Tova's uh, husband, Robert Philipson, I'm called. I used to be British, but I think I'm pretty hybrid, having lived in other countries almost in my entire adult life. And I'm notorious for having written a book called Linguistic Imperialism, which has to do with the role of English uh, in the modern world and who decides what's happening to it. But it's it's great to be with you today. Okay, thanks, everyone. So... Just to introduce the purpose of this evening, we, we have two, two main things that we're here to talk about. I'm going to put two questions to the panel 
and they'll respond to each of them in answers of about five minutes each. Then we'll open up to questions from the audience, hopefully have a, a nice discussion later on. Um, the two topics that we're going to talk about, one is, um, Joey has mentioned them both, one is related to Global Language Advocacy Day, which is uh, an international event which was held for the second time on Wednesday this week. Um, Global Language Advocacy Day is organized by the Global Coalition for Language Rights, which I'm involved with. Um, Global Coalition for Language Rights is a volunteer network of activists, academics, con concerned citizens, uh, translation professionals, and so on, who all work together to promote publicly the importance of language rights and to support one another in the various work that we do, whether that is ensuring language access to people in critical services like health and education, or studying the abuses of linguistic human rights and so on. Uh, Global Language Advocacy Day is kind of a coordinated day of action where all the members of the coalition from around the world uh, try to host events like this one, try to raise awareness on social media, uh, about the importance of language rights, uh, always focusing on a different theme each year. So this year, the theme for Global Language Advocacy Day uh, is also the title of the talk for this evening, which is Language Rights Save Lives. So the aim of focusing on this theme <clears throat> was to really highlight the ways in which uh, recognizing and respecting linguistic human rights can literally be a matter of life and death for people in various circumstances. And I expect we'll hear about some of those circumstances uh, from the speakers this evening. So that's one purpose with Global Language Advocacy Day and discussing this theme of language rights save lives. We'll come to that in the second half. Where we're going to begin, however, is uh, by launching this lovely new publication, the Handbook of Linguistic Human Rights, which was edited by Turva and Robert, which I was lucky enough to contribute to, which Ahmed and Shivani have also contributed chapters to. So we're going to take this opportunity to talk a little bit about what is the state of the art of the study of linguistic human rights at present within academia, um, what are the debates, what's the standing of the discipline, and what is the significance of that uh, handbook within this uh, broader context. So some of us, as we've heard, have had long-standing involvement in this debate around linguistic human rights. Uh, some of us work on these issues in different fields. I'm an anthropologist in different contexts in relation to different issues such as education or healthcare and so on. So I think from the panelists that we have, we should get a, a nice overview of this uh, topic. So we're going to start by talking about the, the handbook. I'm going to pass the microphone to Robert, just with this first question of what do you see the state of the art of academic research on linguistic human rights as being currently and what's the contribution that this uh, new handbook makes to that field thank you okay thank you gerald and i will give you a quick sample of what the handbook covers linguistic justice is exemplified in many chapters in part three of the handbook case studies of linguistic human rights being violated in different parts of north america I could have taken other areas as well. The first is on Nunavut in Northwest Canada, where financial support for Inuktut is a tiny fraction of what French gets. Despite some legal autonomy, structural marginalization of Inuit interests and their languages continues. This is in chapter 19, written by a political leader, Aluki Kotiak. There is a moving chapter on brutal colonization in New Brunswick in the East, 
including policies of linguicide and historicide of the Malicites, who are reverting to the original name for their land, Wolastokeikowewik, the language of the river people, which is in chapter 20. And the author, Andrea Bear Nicholas, has for decades made strenuous efforts to revitalize the language successfully within certain frameworks. And there's also a more general history of linguistic human rights for indigenous peoples in the USA in chapter 21 by John Rayner. Part four of the handbook, Implementing Linguistic Human Rights, has an interesting presentation of Pueblo revitalization in education in Southwest United States by Christine Sims in chapter 38. And in Latin America, Linguistic human rights from within language communities are seen as being in a time of promise in chapter 37 by Gabriela Perez Baez and Yasnaya Elena Aguirre Gil. The challenge of analyzing the role of translation and interpretation for promoting, for promoting linguistic human rights <laughs> is summarized by a Latino in Texas, chapter 45, Gabriel Gonzalez Nunez which belongs in the part five, the final part of the book, which is called Cross-Cutting Issues in Linguistic Human Rights. A medical researcher friend of mine is soon going to be in Utah for a conference. The organizers might mention the First Nations peoples with strong cultural legacies that continue to flourish in Utah, Ute, Navajo, Paiute, Goshute, and Shoshone. But if this contextual reality is mentioned at the conference, it's probably tokenism and definitely does not acknowledge the need for reparations for the dispossession of these people's territories, cultures, and languages. Unlike what Gerald Roche was saying about the two languages where he is in Australia. Ahmed Kabel, who's with us as a panelist, makes the case in the book for reparative, for reparations, reparative linguistic justice in chapter 10 of the handbook in part one, approaches to linguistic human rights, which is otherwise about various scholarly approaches to the whole issue of linguistic human rights, law, economics, history, uh, and, 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 and a whole range of disciplines. The experience of compiling the entire handbook over the last three years for Tova and me leads us to write in our concluding afterward that we live in troubled times and that few governments are committed to actively supporting minority languages. The human rights system was established to combat injustice and repression. This is extremely uphill in a world in which truth is no longer respected Trumpism in the USA, Boris Johnson in the UK, in what are supposed to be democracies. And though some European countries are also led by autocrats, Orban in Hungary, but also when China and Russia are dictatorships and when Saudi Arabia became chair of the United Nations Human Rights Council in 2015. These major constraints confirm the need for a handbook of linguistic human rights that reveals what needs to be done, what can be done, and what is being done successfully in some contexts. And now Tobo will continue. Well, similar to what Robert mentioned about Utah, many of our colleagues in the US and Canada have in their letterheads well-intentioned tokenisms about those on whose lands their universities are. Gerald, uh, yours was not tokenism, by the way. Uh, at least uh, this makes the original owners of the lands visible. Uh, but my note is indigenous peoples, of course, say that people don't own the land. The land owes, owns the people. But naming them the indigenous peoples is only a start. It does in no way address the earlier and worldwide ongoing neocolonialist and imperialist expropriation of their lands and waters. We are living what Nancy Fraser in her 2022 book calls cannibal capitalism, and it is getting worse day by day. Is there any hope 
do national and international laws, conventions, and covenants help in achieving more linguistic justice? To some extent, yes. Several chapters in the book give thorough descriptions of the history and present status of these legal documents. Many of the authors have worked more or less a lifetime with them. They point out some of the strengths the documents have, but also the many weaknesses. Several examples in the book show that even if states or international organizations, such as the United Nations, can agree on some improvements on paper, implementing them is mostly a long struggle. After the Nunavut chapter in the book by Alok Kotyak, which Robert mentioned, and several earlier reports on the Nunavut situation have contended that the Canadian state is committing both linguistic and cultural genocide in the education of the Inuits. The latest discussions about Nunavut earlier this February showed that the relevant Canadian high-level politicians and civil servants in this case, Pablo Rodriguez, Minister of Canadian Heritage, and, <coughs> and Paul Pellet, Pelletier, Director General Indigenous Languages at the Department of Canadian Heritage, are not willing to act. They only presented good sounding excuses as usual. UNESCO, though, is making some careful progress as their statement on the Mother Language Day two days ago, recommending mother tongue-based multilingual education shows. Much is happening in UNESCO's Bangkok office as Kirk Persons, the uh, chapter in the book shows. But even UNESCO's message two days ago is weakened by lack of clear-cut definitions. For instance, not all is making clear enough the difference between using a language as the main medium of teaching and learning and teaching it as a subject only. As we say in our introduction to the handbook, researchers and legal documents from various areas represented in our multi and transdisciplinary book define many basic concepts in different ways, if they define them at all. This is true of concepts such as language, minority, ethnicity, indigenous peoples, tribals, linguism, linguistic and cultural genocide, and linguistic human rights. As the fate of the Uyghurs in China and the Kurds in Turkey, and we have chapters on both in the book, show we need agreements on how to define central concepts so that we know what we are talking about. Today's Ukraine is a case in point. And what I think we need is a completely new independent UN that is able to act, not only talk. That, that is a tall order. Thank you very much to both of you. I think I will pass it next to Shivani, if you could um, share with us your reflections about the the state of linguistic human rights in the world, the study of linguistic human rights and the significance of this handbook. Thank you. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much. Uh, the one, the state of linguistic human rights world over as we are observing, you know, far from uh, the language questions getting addressed, we find that between languages, different languages competing to be the new English. Uh, so in that sense, you know, the hierarchical arrangement of languages never is getting challenged. So in some countries, you will see the domination of English over other languages, you know, over other languages. You come to India, for instance, you'll find that it's usually the languages of the dominant that even gets the status as regional languages of the state. Right. So in different ways, the hierarchy continues, the domination continues. Uh, and for me, one <clears throat> very important question, since we are discussing human rights and, you know, lives of people, is also that, uh, you know, who gets to theorize? Uh, who gets to uh, advance knowledge? And the fact that, you know, today we are all gathered here and we are, uh, like Tove said, forced to speak in the language of the oppressor. Uh, 
is because that if I want to ask questions, if I want to contribute to theory, I have little recourse uh, outside English. So, uh, you know, for me, it's important. I mean, and the, the, the entry point for me in this book uh, is how do we reflect at the question of language at higher education, you know, which is where knowledge advancement happens. Uh, and to also see whether questions, the misrepresentation, the invisibilization of the historically oppressed and the marginalized in any ways, you know, is find reflection in our new theories. Do our old theories get challenged? So the question of language and higher education is not an often explored one, uh, but an extremely crucial one, uh, you know, and in context of India, you know, you find something very interesting. One is that the school system is highly unequal. It's extremely hierarchical. Uh, most schools are actually non-English medium. The English medium education is available only to elites in India. So if we see different education reports, even of the government, English is used as a medium of education, maybe around 12.9% at primary stage, at 33% at the higher secondary stage. But when students come to university uh, in India, uh, the medium of instruction is predominantly more than 90% in English. Now, these translate into varying kind of difficulties in use of English as a language for now engaging in very complex academic discourse that higher education demands of you. Right, uh, And the consequences on the students vary from failure, alienation from classroom, dropouts, and alarmingly high suicide rates. Uh, you know, we have several crime bureau and other reports in past few decades in India, which have highlighted this. You know, a crucial uh, report uh, that was uh, given by a committee that was formed to examine uh, a high spate of suicides among students coming from disadvantaged contexts. Uh, in premier institutes of the country, uh, actually reported, in, in fact, one of the most important findings of this committee was uh, the, that the fact that the institutions are not taking any initiative for remedial coaching in English language. Uh, and so over the years, you know, even the question of language in higher education has got reduced to, uh, you know, providing some kind of a remedial uh, support system, which doesn't really address students' questions, right? So unlike, uh, you know, students coming from oppressed castes, uh, indigenous identities, linguistic minorities remain marginalized. Their questions do not inform questions of research. Uh, their questions uh, do not reflect, you know, how we are re-examining, re-looking at our existing theories. Uh, not knowing English often excludes them from being selected into research position and doctoral programs as candidates, because what teachers would most likely look at uh, is their ability to be able to write a 500 page document in English, right? Uh, so in those ways, you know, if, if that doesn't get challenged, uh, the fact is that language, you know, concerns around language marginality then remain concerns of few. Academically, I mean, you know, in terms of protest, in terms of movements, of course, there are concerns of people whose lives are getting impacted. But we find very few of their lives getting reflected in academia. Uh, and even if it does, you know, it gets done on behalf. Uh, we find very few active voices from those contexts themselves. So that I think is a huge problem. And, you know, especially those of us who come from any imagination of critical theorization, critical research, it's important that people be here, uh, you know, actively owning their voices and raising these questions. Uh, so that has been, you know, my entry point in this book, of course, uh, have engaged with questions of schooling and <clears throat> in the communities where I work. Uh, in pandemic uh, and in the context of pandemic, you know, when one saw that how predomination of certain languages also led to a large scale information symmetry when it came to uh, sharing, you know, information about what was extremely important at that point of time. Uh, 
so these are important <laughs> questions that you know we consistently have to be asking and as we ask you know for language rights at the level of uh, you know health rights education rights and so on i think an important question is also you know in which languages will knowledge continue to be produced and uh, shared and accessed um so yeah these are uh, you know this is what uh, this has been a concern that i have tried to highlight and i'm sure this is a concern which uh, may ring true for many uh and something on which i would be glad to take questions and interact more on thank you thanks so much shivani i will go over to ahmed now for your mm -hmm. reflections on this topic thanks Thank you, thank you, Gerald, and I am I am very delighted to be here. Um, my my contribution to the handbook um, uh, is twofold. Uh, I have a chapter in the theory section, uh, which, in response to Shivani, uh, that Caliban and and his children can also theorize. <laughs> so I'll do my best to give you a brief outline of what that uh, chapter is about. Um, so the chapter attempts to um, offer um, a critique of the um, Eurocentrism of mainstream human rights and their um, fundamental entanglements with uh, colonialism, uh, capitalism, and global coloniality. Um, it is also an attempt to um, look into the contemporary political and ideological imbrication of um, hegemonic, the hegemonic regime of human rights with new liberalism, and particularly the harm that is occasioned um, now that we're talking about linguistic human rights, the harm that is occasioned by global linguistic coloniality. So this is what the broad framework of my intervention um, in, in the handbook. And, and uh, specifically, um, the the chapter engages with um, the neoliberal reconfiguration of culture and identity, uh, uh, particularly in the backdrop of the articulation of cultural and linguistic claims and linguistic human rights. Okay, it it, it also addresses how critiques of linguistic human rights. Uh, particularly academic critiques of, human, of linguistic human rights, paradoxically um, replicate um, neoliberal ideologies and, and politics. So there, I think it is a, a truism to say that our age, uh, as, as Robert pointed out, our troubled times are also troubled in part because of the ravages of neoliberalism in the past four decades across the world. And, and there's clearly a neoliberal capture of the discourse and practice of human rights globally. So not only are human rights um, subsidiary to neoliberalism, but they also offer the moral ammunition against neoliberal excesses. So their, their purchase is practically one of um, offering a moral universe to counteract the ravages of neoliberalism. But fundamentally, they do operate, um, what I mean by they is the Eurocentric human rights, they do operate as an ideological veil to neoliberal hegemony. So they are, in, in effect, a superstructural apparatus um, that normalizes neoliberal uh, accumulation and, and expansion. So I, I think it's it's fundamental to understand how contemporary discourses of human rights um, overlap and intersect with dominant discourses of neoliberalism. Um, and to give you a sense of how this um, intersects with um, how we understand language and identity, uh, it's important to recognize that um, Neoliberalism as a dislocative project has also uh, generated um, a, a certain dis disjuncture in how we have 
come to understand our symbolic worlds. Um, and so has become in itself a, an apparatus of subjectification. Uh, so there are uh, increasingly new reconfigurations of how we perceive ourselves, how we perceive culture, how we perceive identity, rights, and languages in ways that reproduce um, the fundamental ideological assumptions of neoliberalism, okay? And uh, in my chapter, I talk about neo -multicult uh, neoliberal multiculturalism as a mode of state um, governance of cultural difference of uh, linguistic diversity and how these policies are very much embedded in larger fr frameworks of, of, of neoliberal, um, uh, the neoliberal framework. Um, discourses also around how identities are constantly shifting, how they're ind indeterminate, how they're unstable, um, uh, also greatly um, dovetail with dominant discourses of, um, of, of neoliberalism and how it constructs the subject as a, uh, a practically, not as a subject, but as a, but as a project, uh, as a portfolio of monetized and mark marketable um, assets. So these dominant conceptions, which of course have their, their own origins in postmodern theory, um, seem to be uh, completely in cahoots with, um, with, with the neoliberal, uh, neoliberal project. So that was my, um, at least part of my intervention in that chapter. Um, the second part, uh, which we'll probably um, uh, broach in the second part of our own of our of of of, of the seminar uh, has to do with decolonial human rights and how we need to reconceive um, linguistic human rights in a new decolonial key in ways that de-link with um, um, the the dominant um, regime of neoliberalism, but also how to de-link from global uh, coloniality. So I stop here, Gerald, and hopefully we'll deal with that second part uh, in in the um, uh, in the in the in the upcoming part of our event today. Sure, thank you very much, and um, thanks to all the panelists for your comments. If I can just briefly try to summarize the gist of what people were saying, I think the the real importance of this handbook is that in the real world we have this. Uh, deep need for some kind of theoretical leverage that will enable people around the world to pursue linguistic justice. Uh, we need this because we have deepening authoritarianism, we have democratic recession, we have the neoliberal capture of human rights discourses. We have the persistent effects of colonialism all around the world. And in this context, we, we know that this has profound effects on people's everyday lives all around the world. Um, and despite this, within the academy, there has been this drawing back from, drawing away from the concept of language rights and linguistic human rights. Uh, it, in many disciplines remains a pariah concept, unfortunately. We have this wonderful interdisciplinary field, but which includes international law, anthropology, political science, linguistics, uh, educational theorists, and so on. And as much as that is a source of collaboration and solidarity, it's also a source of vulnerability with each of those different disciplines mounting their own critique of linguistic human rights, just at the moment where it seems to be so important everywhere. So that's I'll use that to segue to the second theme that we're going to talk about is this idea of, well, why is this topic important in the practical sense, in the real world and, and in, in the human lives that people are living? And th that's where this suggestion comes up that uh, language rights save lives, that um, respecting linguistic human rights, that defending linguistic human rights from the ravages of the state and transnational capital and so on. Um, 
saves lives, whether that is in the immediate sense of prevents people from dying or in a slower, longer, drawn out sense of um, creating equity in terms of the quality and quantity of life between people everywhere, regardless of whatever language that they speak. So I will hand the microphone over to our panelists to give some reflections on this topic of language rights save lives. And we're going to start this time with uh, Shivani. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Gerard. Uh, you know, in fact, when we are talking about language rights saving lives, uh, in continuation, you know, with what I was uh, trying to say about theorization and, you know, who really gets access to more nuanced form of knowledge. A concern that I feel is important to highlight is, you know, in the kind of times that we live in today, you know, with many, again, if I uh, cite the context of third world countries like India, with many with smartphones in hand and an easy access to, say, internet, uh, you know, what are the languages in which actually knowledge is getting accessed and what are the languages in which there is a mass misinformation flow? Uh, in terms of, you know, who gets headlines and rhetoric and who has access to what forms the basis of those headlines and rhetoric in terms of, you know, evidence, arguments, theories, etc. And I'm thinking of this in context of, you know, the massive spread of fake news, misinformation on social media, which, which is happening today and which is costing lives in so many ways from encouraging ill-advised health decisions to hate crimes. Uh, you know, we are living in times where people, many in India would, you'll find that, uh, especially with onset of pandemic, where it became important to have a smartphone to even be able to access education. People have access to smartphones, there is internet, there is basic literacy and digital literacy, and all kinds of misinformation are being thrust on them, you know, from misinformation on health, nutrition, to economic scenario, to, you know, uh, misguided statistics on developmental indexes and on each other on communities, right? Where lies are getting uh, miscrowded as facts. And all of this can happen because the ones who are receiving all this misinformation and lies as one-liners in their language, again, are the ones who really don't have access to knowledge discourse because that, the access to that gets gets restricted by such few languages, right? So I often meet people who would have received something in their own language about some, uh, you know, misrepresented historical fact, uh, which can then become a basis for inducing and encouraging people to lynch one another, to engage in hate crimes. But these are also people, you know, who have some basic literacy in a language without having access to real knowledge in their languages, you know, whereby they can verify facts, uh, they can think about the arguments, they can think about the, uh, you know, different kind of evidences. Uh, and we are seeing, uh, you know, what, what is happening to the world because of that, right? Uh, if, and hence the, you know, language question in terms of having Lang having knowledge advanced and created in multiple and multiple languages uh, will perhaps address, you know, this vast asymmetry that we have in terms of who gets the real information and who becomes victim to a mass peddling of lies. Uh, you know, it might not immediately strike one as a question of language. Uh, but the fact is that it becomes easy uh, to distract somebody, uh, to misinform somebody, uh, given that you know that with, with, with their home languages being so disconnected uh, from the languages in which academics happen, in which histories are written, in which medical health information is, uh, it makes them very, very easy buyers of misinformation and lies. Uh, so a, a huge threat to lives is also because this distinction between basic literacy and knowledge, you know, has remained and many governments have been okay with accepting the idea of literacy as the idea of 
education, right? Uh, so I think that's one uh, troubling thing that one is also finding in times of today that I would want to highlight uh, as to how, you know, questions of language uh, <clears throat> also have different kind of implications than ones that are most easily visible. Great. Thank you so much, Shivani. We'll go over now to Ahmed for your reflections. Thank you. Yes, I'll offer a set of um, fragmented um, theoretical reflections on the question of life. <clears throat> and I think um, it's important to frame the question in a broader politics of life, rather than, at least from my own perspective, rather than a directly practical um, reflex to how language rights actually save lives um, because I believe that framing the question in that large um, uh, uh, perspective is important um, and my my entry point into this is a is a is an foregrounding of intersectional liberation um, and I think talking of linguistic human rights and the liberatory potential um, requires that we, uh, situate those politics in a much larger frame, uh, in a much larger imperative of intersectional liberation, namely questions of self-determination, cultural autonomy, economic and political sovereignty, um, and global equality. Um, these were and have been at the core of contestatory third world uh, projects and minority and indigenous resistance. So a, a broader politics of life necessitates that we locate the question of life and linguistic human rights in this vast um, universe of intersectional uh, liberation. And so in that respect, and speaking of life, um, uh, decolonial, at least from my own uh, point of view, uh, decolonial linguistic human rights should be attentive to the enduring necropolitics of linguistic coloniality. Because um, I, I do believe that the, um, in the same way that we live in the colonial Lucene, uh, we also live in an age of the linguicine. Um, and that again behooves us to um, grapple with the questions of linguistic necropolitics that are um, uh, constitutive of global linguistic coloniality, okay? Um, so attending to those structures or necrostructures of uh, linguistic uh, destruction is essential, um, but in terms of how um, global language dominating, that domination functions in a variety of, of contexts, but also primarily in, in, uh, in the intersection between um, what might be linguistic necropolitics, but also epistemic necropolitics, which I think Shivani has um, has has talked about, um, and so I think, uh, at least uh, from this point of view, uh, we need to disarticulate um, this question of human rights broadly, and also um, linguistic human rights, and rearticulate them within this large uh, framework of what what in the chapter I call Vita politics or vita linguistics. It's a linguistic, uh, linguistics of life, a linguistics of, uh, a politics of life and a linguistics of, of life that, that uh, not just attenuate, but completely de-link uh, from the, the ravages of, of the contemporary neoliberal regime, but also the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, enduring impacts of global uh, coloniality and particularly linguistic coloniality. Great, thank you so much. We'll pass over to Kova and Robert now for the final comments on this section, thanks. Uh, when I think of some of the examples that we have in the experiential evidence part of uh, our last uh, chapter, that has a lot about, uh, about how language rights 
may save lives. Likewise, if uh, people have the opportunity to read Gerald's latest article on necropolitical uh, issues, necro, not negro, or whatever it was in, yeah. in this uh, uh, in in this uh, what is it called? Whatever uh, what we can see, uh, the examples are there. Uh, what I would like to say then is the continuing expropriation of ITMs, lands and waters. ITM stands for Indigenous Tribal uh, Minority and Minoritized. So the continu continuing expropriation of ITMs, lands and waters has often led to genocide and ecocide. Uh, it has also made and continues to make the exploitation of ITMs and minoritized people, peoples, as well as local people, a global norm. Extracting the oil, the minerals, and so on, ruins not only the lands and waters and the air, meaning our planet, but they also uh, ruin people's chances to continue their lives either where they have lived and often also elsewhere. It makes also their knowledges of sustainable living disappear. And this happens every day on most continents, as we know. Linguistic expropriation, which we have examples of in book, often also leads to linguistic and cultural genocide and other crimes against humanity. And this is clear in most educational systems in the world where ITMs are involved, even in those where they are excluded from formal education. And several chapters in the book illustrate all this. But what is unusual with this handbook and which I love most in it is not only the incredibly impressive lineup of authors, but also the very different styles of the contributors. Many handbooks provide the authors with a model or blueprint that they are more or less supposed to follow. For instance, a brief, his brief history of the research area, an overview of theoretical approaches and key issues, early and later case studies, methodological and problematic issues, new theoretical insights, conclusions with future desiderata. Often authors are asked to depersonalize their chapters. They are supposed to present various approaches and trends objectively and or not to express their own opinions. To express these opinions is sometimes seen as unscientific. This can sometimes lead to what could be called parliamentary science. Present the alternatives objectively and let, let the reader vote. We have very few examples of this in the book, but then we did not give the authors a blueprint to follow. The only restrictions were on length. The diversity of approaches is, we think, a real strength in the handbook. All authors are deeply involved in the topic, also personally, as we can hear, for instance, when Shivani speaks. Several also illustrate the analysis with their own experiences. Some chapters are really tough to read, for instance, Ahmed's, <laughs> and uh, to some extent, Gerard's also. <laughs> Many are in between. Uh, a few chapters are like exciting short stories, sometimes sad, sometimes optimistic. Many chapters are in between, and most authors are at the same time activists in the area too. And I would like to take the opportunity to thank all the authors. Your chapters complement each other. They don't uh, 
they they are not in no way uh, trying to com uh, to uh, compete with each, each other and you are all just wonderful but writing and talking is not enough paula freire said as we remember we make the road by walking and even fantastic books like this handbook imply mostly talking but we all hope that the book might inspire to some more walking too. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll Thanks. continue. It's, it's, it's a hard act to follow after these very inspiring uh, contributions by all the other panelists. But And I also think it's invidious to select chapters that make a unique contribution to the book because uh, all of the chapters do. But I will comment on three and draw a connection to a fourth. The chapter on Indonesia by Huell Coleman, a Welsh origin and David Firo Indonesian, is a painstaking study of how information for the population in Indonesia on coping with the COVID pandemic was not disseminated in languages that were comprehensible for much of the population. This confirms the familiar pattern of the class system favoring the privileged and sacrificing the lives of the poor. And since the medical world knows that new pandemics are bound to emerge, probably soon, a language policy that respects linguistic human rights is needed in all countries worldwide. One can generalize that from the Indonesian experience. My second example is the chapter on Nepal, which the British call Nepal, written by two influential Nepalis, Lava Deo Awasti, who Tova and I have known for 30 years since he did his doctorate in Denmark, Yogendra Prasad Yadava, and a Canadian linguistic anthropologist, Mark Turin. And all three of these people have extensive experience of working with Nepali communities. The chapter presents the complexity of the constitution and legislation and court cases much of which impressively aims to ensure the rights of speakers of all Nepali languages. However, as we write in the afterword, Tova and I cite information from Lava, who informed us that the constitution makes no provision for English to play a role in the country. However, the act relating to compulsory and free education grants to English the right to figure as a medium of instruction alongside Nepali and other tongues. And this leads Lava to conclude, and as you can see from the notes on contributors in the book, he's exceptionally well informed. English will progressively, and I quote from Lava, eat up the Nepali language as well as all other mother tongues of Nepal, which lack the power and resources to compete with English. And they've written about this. After which Tov and I add in our afterwards, some of these resources are international aid efforts that preponderantly serve to strengthen the learning of English and not Nepali languages. And this is a familiar form of educational and linguistic imperialism that suppresses the linguistic human rights of national languages. And one could predict that this means that if more and more uh, less privileged Nepali people are having education through the medium of English, their education will be a failure. It will not giving them better chances in life. And the government, we also state in the afterward that the governments of the United States and the UK, citing the Kenyan scholar Mazrui and of Australia, citing Jackie Widin, all of them are guilty of strengthening English at the expense of other languages which is what the World Bank has done for decades, although it might be getting a slightly more differentiated position now. But this is what happens when market forces are given free reign, which is what the uh, Nepalis are arguing against. And then the third chapter I will talk briefly about is my own chapter on global English, which pleads for conceptual clarity when analyzing the diverse functions of English as an international language. It summarizes key factors that account for its expansion and how the European Union's management of multilingualism can maintain the vitality of all 24 official and working languages, even when English is privileged for some functions and, and French for others. 
But more significantly, and very much tying in with what uh, Ahmed has been talking about, my chapter also shows how privatization of public education in Sweden, generally involving an increased use of English, strengthens global corporate interests, venture capital, libertarian interests, and banks. English is playing a constructive role, quite unlike that, in international efforts to support Ukraine, militarily and politically, but NATO is being strengthened thanks to Putin, with English as the primary language. And this means that the US military industrial complex benefits, as does the geopolitical aims of the Anglosphere, the efforts of the dominant English speaking countries to perpetuate global, essentially American domination. These are very complex issues on which a lot has been written, but all my examples serve to underline the decisive importance that there should be explicit language policies and that linguistic human rights issues should be addressed rather than sidelined, since they are in fact of existential importance for life of languages, for both national languages and for national minority languages. And this is also demonstrated in the chapter on Ukraine in a very convincing way. And that all of that is why the handbook is well over 700 pages, all of which need careful study. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And thanks again to all the panelists for your reflections there. Um, we've come in just on the hour now, which is wonderful. We'll have about half an hour for conversation and questions. I might just ask Joey, since we had several people, quite a few people join us since the introduction, if you could maybe just remind us how the questions will work, what people should do if they have a question, and then we can go to um, the audience. Over to you, Joey. Sure, great, thanks. First, I'll just remind you that we're recording. Uh, if you do want to participate in the question and answer, you have a couple options here. You can put your question in the chat if you wanted to write it out. There's also a Q&A icon in your Zoom where you could put a question in there and I can read those out for you. Or you can use the raise hand function. And I already have one hand raised, actually. So, Gerald, do you mind if I just go to uh, that first hand? Uh, I believe it's Garav or Garav. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to speak if you want to ask your question. Uh, you may have to press the unmute button. Meanwhile, other people can feel free to uh, raise their hands or put their questions down. Okay, so uh, Gerald might not be there to ask the question. So um, Gerald, if you wanna get us started with a question and we'll give everyone else a chance to put their questions in. We've just had a question come up in the chat. So I'll put that to the, the panel and uh, whoever would like to answer it first is welcome to. So we have a question about uh, what do you think about sign languages as minority and minoritized languages? Um, would anyone care to answer that question for us? <laughs> Can I say something about that? We have uh, two uh, chapters in the book uh, about sign languages. One is uh, by one is uh, by people from uh, from Gallaudet University in Washington D.C., which is uh, the only university that functions mainly uh, through the medium of uh, sign language, and that is uh, unfortunately the American sign language. Uh, there's another chapter by three. Uh, high-level people from the World Federation of the Deaf. And what is important with them is that they can, they can use both uh, legal protection that comes from seeing them as a disabled group and legal protection that uh, comes from uh, them being a linguistic minority, minoritized group. And uh, of course, uh, the one of the books uh, called Deaf Gain shows uh, very clearly that there are uh, very many uh, uh, 
advantages uh, that deaf people have that we who are not deaf uh, don't have. For instance, they can see much, much more, more than we do. Uh, but uh, most people who talk about languages and even language rights, linguistic human rights, do not seem to take into consideration the deaf. And there's a lot there to learn. Thank you. Would anyone else like to add some more perspectives on that question? Do we have any other questions from the audience? I might put a question to everyone while we're waiting. We, we have a question. Here we are in the Q&A. So I'll, I'll put that to you and I'll hold off my question. A recurring theme in all of today's presentations has been the role of neoliberalism in first perpetuating linguicide and second co-opting linguistic human rights almost as an aesthetic. Is it possible to combat linguicide on the ground without working to dismantle the socioeconomic foundations of neoliberalism? Thank you for that question. Um, would anyone like to weigh into that? I feel like, Ahmed, this is your question. <laughs> Shivani, your hand has gone up. Uh, well, uh, is it possible to combat linguicide on the ground without working to dismantle the foundations of neoliberalism? No, it isn't. Uh, <laughs> at least that's what uh, uh, I would very strongly believe uh, and also you know because if we see uh, you know what Robert also shared earlier and uh, which is the argument Tove and Robert have been making in several papers of theirs uh, the privatization of public education uh, you know is also largely happening in English uh, we see who's controlling knowledge today right and that controlling of knowledge is not just to you know legitimize, legitimize different forms of power, but largely the interests of the global capital. So in India, you see a shift where uh, you know this privatization of education is also parallelly accompanied by a shift towards skills. You know, not so much as social sciences, not to engage so much in theory and research, but you know how to uh, have skilled labor uh, for the corporates. Right. Uh, so one, uh, you know, uh, the power of certain languages is to actually deny people uh, the knowledge that they need to be able to resist, to realize that something which is happening uh, is not the way it should be. Right. Uh, and co-option, you know, co-option, even if we see how co-option is happening, like you said, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's an aesthetic level of co-option, which means the co-option, uh, you will see that languages in context of India getting maybe uh, included till primary levels, uh, at most till middle school levels, the co-option will not really allow it to grow more. So, you know, uh, the co-option co is also extremely limited, uh, extremely defined and restrictive, uh, so to say. Uh, so I don't see how, uh, you know, uh, the combat to linguicide on the ground can happen without dismantling the socioeconomic foundations of neoliberalism. Thank you for that, I would, Shivani. I, 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 would also, also, I would also add that there is a subjectifying element to neoliberalism that's important to take into account. So in, in addition to the economic um, infrastructure of neoliberalism, namely privatization and the rest, um, neoliberalism also functions as, a, as an ideological apparatus. Um, and we, we, we've seen increasingly language policies being embedded um, within global economic discourses of human capital um, and the knowledge economy, which are 
um, constitutive of the global neoliberal project. Um, so the idea that human beings are um, an assemblage of skills that can be monetized and that and that human beings themselves are capital and they 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 are constituted by this capital that they can invest um this is not only a an attempt by the neoliberals to refute Ma marxist uh, labor theory of value um but this is a a total reconstitution of the subject of what it means to be human um and so one front with regard to um delinking from neoliberalism is not just to delink from the socio-economic and um and so primarily the economic structure of neoliberalism but also to delink from its own ideological universe this idea that human beings are fundamentally entrepreneurs of themselves um there are also forms of neoliberal language policies, uh, even forms of multilingualism that are decidedly neoliberal, uh, which uh, create um, um, a hierarchy of linguistic value based on divisions like languages of the knowledge economy, languages of the human cap of human capital, uh, languages of economic development and languages of identity, languages of authenticity, and and so on and so forth. And in most cases, these policies that are centered on a new liberal recasting of multilingualism also dovetail with cultural policies that are also um, centered on a new liberal management of cultural difference. So, in addition to the infrastructural uh, economic foundation of neoliberalism, there is a, an equally insidious ideological project that one has to attend to and dealing from in, in order to create truly, truly liberatory language policies. I can go on, but I think I, at least uh, uh, this is what I can say, uh, uh, speaking to that question directly. I can I say something. Uh, I think, yes. I, I think, uh, in many ways, uh, Torva was uh, uh, talking about linguistic human rights and nobody was listening 50 years ago. Whereas now the very fact that we have drawn on indigenous experience so much in the book means that there are powerful forces which are liberatory in Ahmed's sense, which in fact the book uh, consolidates. And the very fact that this dreadful American publisher who has produced the book we had horrible, fierce battles with them to get them to behave better to, in relation to authors. Um, is 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 in some way showing that that these struggles are are existential and and are succeeding in a very modest way in all sorts of different contexts. But I think that as as both Shivani and Ahmed were saying, and Tova mentioned uh, Nancy Fraser's new book, Cannibal Capitalism. It ties in with issues of race, gender, ethnicity, class, and language tends to be ignored by many scholars, including Nancy Fraser, but it should be there as well. And that's exactly where the liberatory forces that we hope are empowering the whole book uh, can in some way be uh, used in order to try to create more local justice and ideally greater justice uh, in, in wider context. Thank you for that. We have the questions are coming in thick and fast now. I will just I just want to add my own comment to this. Um, how do we seek linguistic justice uh, by dismantling or opposing uh, neoliberalism? I, th I think the concept of rights are really important here for reasons that both Ahmed and Shivani were talking about, um, which have to do with the profound depoliticizing of every aspect of life within neoliberalism. The idea that everything Every problem can be solved by individual effort, individual upskilling, and allowing the market to carry your product up to the level where it belongs. Uh, the, 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 the way that human rights activism is carried out in other fields serves as a useful model here for languages, which is that we, in relation to language, we need to repoliticize these issues, and we can do this by 
adopting the shame and blame model that so many human rights activists have successfully used. We can, we can point out who is the oppressor. We can put their name on the internet. We can show what they've done. We can generate the outrage which is necessary to fuel political action. And so I think in terms of uh, I think it's completely necessary to have an assault on neoliberalism in order to ensure linguistic justice, centering rights and using the mechanisms and the tactics of human rights activism is really important within that. Um, I will go to the next question that we, I just uh, want to I just want yes. to interject very quickly, Gerald. If I can say another uh, dead white man, uh, Bourdieu, uh, Pierre Bourdieu, um, pointed out that the worst form of politics is a politics that denies its own politics. So this interestedness, in his own words, is the most interested form of politics. And so in that very sense, neoliberalism, by claiming to be D, D or apolitical, is the most political of all ideologies, is the most interested of, of all ideologies. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, as a response. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll go to the next question we have in the Q&A, which I'll, I'll read out. How can we introduce linguistic justice and inclusion when most of the political and economic systems with all its institutions like education are the same systems that were introduced and designed using colonizer frames to subjugate indigenous people? For example, denial of linguistic identities, monolingualism, unequal access to resources, etc. The former colonizers may have left, but the new imperialists, the various centers or dominant populations, are still working within these imperialist structures and parameters. So I'll leave that question open to whoever unmutes themselves first. Shivani. Uh, maybe I can try an attempt. Uh, see, one uh, thing is, you know, when we think about the systems, I mean, in case of India, uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, it was the, the system of education in India was brought in by our uh, colonial rulers with an aim that, you know, they would have a class uh, which would serve its interest and will help strengthen its rule, right? Uh, but, you know, the thing with knowledge is, or with education systems is that even as they are designed to maintain certain status quo, to reproduce, uh, you know, the past structures that exist, uh, the possibility of creation there uh, makes them also systems of hope, right? And that is why you see that a colonial education system uh, that was envisaged as something that would strengthen the colonial rule in India uh, actually gave rise to a lot of protesters, rebels who ultimately turned, uh, you know, this, uh, who turned the tide against the colonial rulers. Uh, most of them, you know, most of the freedom fighters were active recipients of this kind of an education system. So we introduce it by creating different kinds of ruptures. Uh, a lot of us, uh, I believe, are also writing in different languages. Uh, you know, my uh, over the years, I would have I worked an instance in trying to make sure that English is not the only language that I'm theorizing or writing in. Uh, the kind of uh, you know interactions, conversations that we make possible in these systems, because the fact is, you know, irrespective of what these systems may have been designed to, people across oppressed contexts have also come into these systems and used them to voice their questions and challenges. So that hope remains. Can we, uh, you know, as possible in this platform, can we bring together these voices? Uh, can we have more conversations? Uh, what kind of pedagogy uh, do we imagine? If I'm talking in terms of educational institutions, I mean, they are not the only institutions. Uh, what kind of, you know, even how do we look at language itself? I mean, in today's Indian classrooms, the English has become very Indian English, 
you know, uh, the way it is being used. So also, what are we doing with the languages that are forced down on us and using them to actively, uh, you know, resist. So I do see that possibility. I mean, the systems may not dictate us. We enter them and then we do something with them. We challenge them. Uh, we sometimes reform them. We sometimes destroy and create something new. Uh, so, I mean, that's the project that we have to be collectively thinking about. Would anyone else like to jump in with an answer to this uh, question? I think the same is much the case in, in, in former African colonies as well. Uh, uh, same, same as Shivani is saying. Uh, but I mean, I, no, think I can only. Uh, uh, and, and, and also, uh, clearly, uh, indigenous peoples worldwide are infinitely more active now than they were 20, 30 years ago. So, I mean, there are all sorts of ways in which. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the system is being challenged uh, relatively successfully. Also in Latin America, so-called Latin America, where there are many uh, educators who think that that uh, formal education, as they have uh, uh, inherited it from the colonizers, is uh, something that is extremely dangerous and they would like to chuck out uh, all those ideologies which are uh, prevalent in today's formal education, even in the kind of education that is supposedly organized by indi some indigenous groups themselves. So uh, teachers are the new missionaries. Okay, I'll just... Um... In terms of the remaining time that we have, we have about 10 more minutes. We have a few questions in the Q&A and one in the webinar. So I'll just go to the next question that came up in the Q&A, which is about Malawi. Then I'll go into the chat and we have a question about English hegemony. And then the last question in the Q&A is specifically directed to Shivani. Hopefully we can get through all of those in... Um, mm -hmm. 10 minutes, but I appreciate everyone's enthusiasm that you have so many questions. It's... Can, can, I, can I just say something, um, um, speaking to the question, uh, the previous question. Um, the, the question is, can these colonial institutions save us? And then the other, the corollary to that is, can we save ourselves without institutions? And so the question then becomes, what kind of in, what kinds of institutions do we establish that allow us both to subvert the colonial dark side of institutions like modern education, that we can also uh, conscript for our own liberation? And so I find myself in agreement here with uh, Harney and Moten that universities and education institutions can be a refuge uh, for those who have nowhere else to inhabit. Um, but the only thing we can do is that we can steal things from them. And I think that's one way of um, framing how we can subvert those institutions to our own ends. Is that in the same way that they have cut cannibalized us, we can also cannibalize them for our own purposes. <laughs> Thank you, Ahmed. So the last three questions are really going to get to the, the heart of the issue in practical terms. We have um, this question about the situation in Malawi. So as a case study in Malawi, we have over 14 endogenous languages. However, information is principally accessible in only one endogenous language to the exclusion of the others. Drawing from the views of the participants, how can we empower the other speakers of the minority languages so that they access pertinent information in their languages in order to achieve linguistic human rights? Of course, this is the million dollar 
question, not just in Malawi, but everywhere. Um, anyone who would like to give a succinct answer is welcome to. You. You you could go to some of the webinars of the Bangkok UNESCO uh, set up, and uh, after reading, uh, for instance, uh, uh, Joe Lobianco's article about Myanmar and uh, Kirk Pearson's article about uh, about the Bangkok UNESCO, uh, you would have several practical ways of uh, seeing how it can be done in countries where there are hundreds and hundreds of languages. Yeah, and I think uh, also that that's where what UNESCO is doing in uh, Asia is trying to ensure that there is constructive dialogue between grassroots people and academics and political decision makers. And there is very clear evidence that this is succeeding in promoting mother tongue based uh, multilingual education, even in very diverse contexts. And there are ways and means of, of, of achieving that. Uh, and that's exactly what Joel Abanka was trying to achieve in, in uh, Myanmar with diversity management in order to create peace conditions. Unfortunately, of course, then the military intervened and uh, wrecked uh, all of those efforts. But it doesn't alter the fact that uh, clearly the more uh, critical scholarship can engage with decision makers, uh, the more chances that some of the ideas that we're talking about today have some chance of, of being achieved. And it's a very long haul, as Shivani knows from India, for instance, uh, Ajit Mohanty's article about uh, Odia tells how they have partially succeeded, and Shivani has worked in that project for quite some time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. I will just throw in my own answer very quickly to that, which is that I think the, the, the first step in any situation like this has to be to denaturalize and politicize the problem, to show that there is an issue, that it is political, that it is not the natural state of affairs. And often that foundational political work will set the direction for where things go from, from there. But we have this vast library of techniques and technologies and positive examples to follow but without that that foundation of realizing that there is a problem that's created by someone and that can be solved i think it's uh it's hard to put any of those solutions into work i'll go to the next question in the in the chat so it says my question is how do you think we can escape the oppressive hegemony of dominant regional and global languages like english Considering that such lingua francas have historically existed to unite people and to make common endeavors possible, such as academia, et cetera, uh, related to that, how should we facilitate the creation of academic or theoretical infrastructure in minorities' languages? I think uh, they should, uh, the, the questioner should read the article on what's happening with the Sami in uh, the Scandinavian countries and Finland. Uh, and it's true that English is expanding in use, but the governments of the Scandinavian countries and Finland have a policy which is intended to create a balance between the dominant national languages and English meaning the expansion of English should not be at the expense of Swedish, Danish, Finnish, and so on. And this is a policy that all higher education institutions are supposed to be implementing and creating some kind of bilingual academic competence. But it's also the case that within Sami issues, meaning the indigenous minority in the far north of Sweden, Finland, uh, and, and mainly Norway. They are not a minority. They are indigenous peoples. They are not a minority. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, and, and there is very successful evidence that by small steps, uh, 
um, greater recognition. I mean, you can go to kindergarten through school up to university level with this indigenous people's language, Sami, uh, in Norway. Uh, so that in all sorts of ways, uh, the, the hegemony of English can be counteracted at the national level. Uh, and then at the local level, you can also ensure greater chance for uh, indigenous languages anywhere in the world to achieve what local people want there, and that is not at the expense of national languages. Uh, Ole Henrik Magga, who is uh, Emeritus Professor of the Sami language and uh, an active reindeer herder and has an article, a chapter in the book, describes uh, how they are trying to do that, have been trying to do this within the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And uh, when, one, uh, when one attends their uh, yearly two-week meetings, one can hear a lot about what people in various parts of the world are doing exactly about this. Read all Hendrik's uh, uh, chapter first. Thank you both. Um, let's go to the last question now, which is directed at Shivani. So if you also want to answer the previous question, you can combine them. So the question for Shivani is, you made a very important distinction between literacy versus knowledge. In the present global scenario, governments will not be interested in giving access to knowledge in minoritized languages. What way forward do you suggest for the speakers of these languages? See, one, governments would never be interested in giving any kind of knowledge uh, that encourages anybody to challenge what they are doing, right? So it's not just in minoritized languages, but what we have seen in India and what is also reflected in the new education policy here is that, you know, demands and resistances on ground uh, do have an impact. They do create pressures on governments. Right. So uh, in our new education policy, despite its limitations, there is a case which is being made for multilingual higher education space for inclusion of more languages. Of course, that comes uh, with certain caveats attached as to, you know, in India, there are many, many languages. So which those languages would be, would it be regional languages at the cost of, say, tribal languages and other languages? which forms of languages. So those questions are there. But one thing is that movements on ground, uh, you know, resistance by people uh, ha do create pressures on governments also. I mean, they cannot function, uh, you know, completely ignoring those pressures. Also, uh, what, uh, you know, another important uh, aspect is uh, responding, all responding also to the previous question. You know, some languages of course, do unite us by becoming the lingua franca. Uh, and one can acknowledge them without letting them become the exclusive language for knowledge access and uh, or for any other access, right? <clears throat> so for example, in India, uh, the fact that we had a three language formula, whereas in school, uh, you know, they used, they, there was to be education started in child's home language or mother tongue, uh, and a uh, national language and a third language, the idea was more lingua francas would be created. What, why the idea did not function well was that unlike the Southern Indian states, which followed the three language formula far more honestly and sincerely, uh, the Northern states did not, right? So the other languages that they opted to learn were either foreign languages or Sanskrit. And hence, you know, more languages could not get added to the lingua franca. So that possibility was also, the, was always there. And uh, another thing which, you know, here it becomes important is that again, in, in academics, uh, many of us will also have to take responsibility of writing in more and more languages or translating works where they exist. Uh, because a lot of times what I see in educational institutions, a reason to exclude languages because there is no literature in them, right? Now, if it becomes a kind of a vicious cycle, right? Because there's nothing written in them, I can't use them. Uh, and if I'm not using them, uh, how does language grow and evolve? 
so that process, I think if we start writing, I mean, uh, there are in some initiatives being made. Uh, one, uh, another red flag is that in India, you know, a lot of translation initiatives and writing support initiatives are being headed in private universities, uh, which also have a certain kind of composition. So this becomes their way of charging high fee from some and making this little allowance for, uh, you know, a small disadvantaged section that we would give them some translated text or writing support. Uh, so of course, you know, this, uh, a, a, a lot of movement for public education needs to be there. And people's resistance on ground does become difficult sometimes for governments uh, to ignore. So that the pressure has to be bottom up, top down both, uh, if I can articulate it that way. Thank you, Shivani. And uh, I'm going to take this opportunity now to wrap up the seminar. I'd just like to thank everyone who uh, you do offered. That, can, I, can, I, can I just say oh, one sure. thing? Thanks oh. enormously to uh, Gerald and Joey for organizing this. And also a reminder that the, that the book has 62 contributors. So that there's a wealth of things there which we haven't touched on at all today. But thanks enormously for what you've done to, to make today possible. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, I just I, I wanted to um, end the talk with a brief uh, with, with a message of hope. I guess we've focused a lot on the the challenges and the complexities and the the darkness of the times that we live in, and there's good reasons for all of those things as well. But what I think all of the chapters uh, in this handbook, and as Robert pointed out, there's no shortage of chapters in the book. Um, they all point out in different ways, in different situations, that there that there are real and substantial reasons for hope wherever we are, that linguistic justice is possible, that linguistic human rights as a political strategy is effective, uh, and it will continue to be effective in the future, whatever that may bring. And the more of us who are contributing to this conversation, uh, the, the the more successful we'll be in that. So I would just like to end, I guess, on a note of solidarity with uh, everyone here, with all of the people in the audience and whoever's come along to listen to the recording afterwards. Um, solidarity with all of you in your struggles, wherever you may be. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. Joey, I guess I'll let you close out the evening for us. Thanks. I'll just reiterate thanks to Gerald, Robert, Tova, Ackman, and Shivani for taking the time to talk about your work, share it, explain it, and take questions and discussion. Thank you to all the attendees who came here. Hopefully this was not only an informative talk, but as we said, something that's inspiring to, to walk the road of linguistic justice as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Gerald. Thank you, everybody.